Well, good morning, and uh, thank you all for coming to AAWS Americas. Uh, uh, we are honored to be hosting His Excellency Aizaz Ahmad Chaudhry, Ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan to the United States. Uh, this event is part of our Distinguished Ambassadors Forum series, uh, which enables leading diplomats to interact with AAWS members and other invitees to our events. So the discussion today is going to um, focus on bilateral U.S.-Pakistan relations, on regional developments, and on strategic issues. Ambassador Chaudhry has served as ambassador uh, to the United States since March. Uh, a member of Pakistan's Foreign Service, he has 36 years of diplomatic uh, experience in both bilateral uh, and multilateral settings. Before coming to Washington, he was uh, Pakistan's foreign secretary. He's also served as the additional foreign secretary for UN and disarmament affairs, in which capacity I uh, had the honor to, uh, to uh, engage with him, and as director, for, uh, director general for relations with South Asian countries. In that capacity, he uh, remained closely associated with the peace process uh, with India. Overseas, he served as the ambassador to the Netherlands as deputy permanent representative of Pakistan to the United Nations in New York and, as pa and in uh, Pakistan's embassies in Doha, uh, Cairo, and uh, Washington. So our event uh, will run for a full hour. Uh, this is on the record. We are live streaming it, and uh, a video will be uh, posted on our website afterwards. We'll take uh, a question and answer after uh, the ambassador's presentation and uh, questions are uh, invited uh, via social media if you would, uh, anybody would like to send a question to me via Twitter. Uh, Fitzpatrick IISS is my handle. Uh, Ambassador, I'll uh, ask you to take the podium and uh, as I do so, let me uh, just start by extending condolences to the uh, terrible, uh, horrific suicide bomb in Lahore. Uh, I know that Pakistan is on the front lines of the fight against terrorism and that your country has suffered more than almost any other country. So uh, condolences to that. Thank you. Thank you, Ma, for inviting me to um, this prestigious forum. Uh, IISS is a very a known name in our uh, foreign service, but also uh, in our strategic circles in particular, uh, for your contribution to the bringing awareness on these issues. Um, I want to also thank you all for coming over. Uh, some of the people that are, uh, are here uh, include Laurel Holgate. I am very, very grateful that you are here. So she herself is, a, is an authority on and ably led the nuclear security summit process, if you all recall that. Well, uh, where do I start? My uh, topic that you have given to me uh, I think I will uh, try to follow that that line. Uh, we all know that the the world uh, is in flux, is in is changing. Uh, what uh, Richard Haas has recently called in his book as the "world in disarray." Uh, I think uh, there are several symptoms that would probably attest to that statement. Uh, and uh, you know, far-reaching development. But for Pakistan, the biggest challenge, honestly, was for the last two decades, uh, how to meet and overcome and defeat the forces of terrorism. Uh, you all are aware of the history and background. I don't have to explain. But it is always good to remind ourselves that with the Afghan Jihad, uh, pursuant to Soviet intervention in Afghanistan came the militants, and after the Soviets and the Americans left, the militants stayed back. And after 9-11, when Tora Bora was bombed heavily, many of these militants moved towards the mountains that straddle between Pakistan and Afghanistan border. And that's where when Pakistan government decided to join the international coalition against terrorism, we became a target of these militants. And our fight with them started. And from 2005, 6 right up to 2014, we had a very difficult time. 
Hardly a day passed when there was not a bomb incident in the country, in one installation or the other. And we suffered enormously. Until 2013, 2014, when the leadership of the country decided that enough is enough, and a series of political conferences was, were organized uh, to achieve that consensus. Right up till then, there was a debate, a debate going on, whose war is it, and why are we fighting it? Is it an imposed war, and why are we killing our own people in our own soil? So that kind of debate was, was raging at that time. Because the militants had come up with a, uh, with a narrative which was short and catchy. The narrative was that this is, uh, uh, this is a war imposed by outsiders, uh, first the Soviets and then the Americans on Afghanistan, and to resist that is a holy duty, so all locals should support us. Now, we know that this was not the right narrative, it was flawed, but somebody had to expose that narrative, and therefore, that consensus helped us do that, because then, you know, we were able to see clearly that uh, those who claimed to be waging jihad or holy duty were actually killing innocent people on the streets, and that's not a holy duty. They were only using and abusing the name of Islam, and therefore, it became very clear that the politicians had to do something, and that's what they did. And once we had that nationwide consensus under our belt, we were able to move into the tribal areas, particularly North Waziristan, where all these militants had hold themselves in. And we were able to, in the next two years, following two years, we were able to clear the whole area. Yes, of course, it came at a huge cost. Uh, over 6,000 security personnel were uh, lost their lives. But in the end, today we stand um, far more secure. Uh, the tribal areas have been now cleared uh, and secured. And we can see that the number of terrorist incidents have come down. Uh, you must have also seen State Department's report that came out last week, which also indicated 29% decline in terrorist incidents in Pakistan compared to global average of 9% decline. So things started looking better. Uh, and that had a salutary effect on the economic situation. But before I go on that, it is important to know that in Pakistan, there's a full recognition that our job is not yet over. And you mentioned the Lahore terrorist attack of uh, last Monday. Uh, I think that's a stark reminder uh, that uh, we still have many evil people hiding somewhere uh, and coming on to attack civilians. Uh, <clears throat> this is now uh, those people who left North Waziristan, who escaped uh, the onslaught, were either went to Afghanistan, some went on to the mountains where they are being tackled, and some came to our urban centers. So we have launched now another intelligence-based operation to calm them out. And we discover uh, that uh, every day we are able to catch some group or the other hiding somewhere in some urban center. So, uh, and it's working nicely. It's working uh, nicely because the local people uh, are now informing us as to who is hiding where. Mostly these are uh, non-Pakistanis, uh, but of course there is always a local component, no matter what you do. So we have... Uh, a situation which is uh, much better now, and that is showing itself in the not only reduction of terrorist incidents in the country, but also improvement of economic situation. Uh, sometimes one is not able to gauge the entirety of the full picture because TV screens really don't tell the whole story. They normally like to sensationalize, but there is a lot of economic uh, activity. Uh, and uh, the optimism is palpable. And that is shown in terms of uh, uh, attracting investors who are flocking in. Uh, of course, the biggest investment is coming from China, but there are others, too, who are uh, uh, coming in from Turkey and from Korea and Europeans. And now from corporate America, actually a large number of American corporations 
uh, have either started increasing their footprint or those who are not there are now going in. And I meet them almost uh, every week, every fortnight. Uh, so that is something uh, which shows that they can see the potential of uh, what is on the, um, on the offer. But we also know that all this could be tentative and at risk if Afghanistan next door is not stable because we have a porous border, an open border, 2,600 kilometers of that, uh, where thousands of people used to cross the border without any documents. So therefore, we have a mighty challenge. We have 3 million Afghan refugees uh, for 37 years. So they uh, have, live in, some of them live in refugee camps. Uh, uh, and uh, many of these uh, uh, Taliban have gone and made sanctuary in Afghanistan. From where they are operating and manipulating these Afghan refugees also, and and, and recruiting them. So therefore, we have a, a we have a major task, and we believe that uh, that task is also for United States itself, uh, because United States too has invested uh, heavily. Uh, in Afghanistan, what some people like to call as the longest war for, for the United States. And there is a review which is going on precisely around that debate whether the United States should pull out or should, should beef up its forces and try to find a solution militarily. Uh, nevertheless, we, this is our conviction in Pakistan that the United States has a genuine interest in stabilizing Afghanistan because enough has been spent and I don't think you would like this war to go on. And therefore, you would like to see a, a logical end to that. We in Pakistan want to see it for our own national reasons. Of course, we all sympathize with the people of Afghanistan who have suffered enormously. But also because uh, we can see that if there are ungoverned spaces, which there are, uh, they become sanctuaries for the bad guys running away from Pakistan and making sanctuaries like tehreek e taliban and jamaat ul ahrar and some others have done that. So we are very conscious of the urgent need for Afghanistan to stabilize. And we have offered to the United States government a number of times our uh, full readiness to work together uh, with the United States to help achieve this aim, because it is in our mutual interest. But Apart from Afghanistan, our next door neighbor, eastern neighbor, India, also uh, matters to mention because, unfortunately, our dialogue with India has not really uh, fruition, nor it is continuing in any manner. And that is a major, major source of uh, uh, unrest in the whole region. I think uh, um, it is our collective failure that we have not been able to engage in a dialogue that would be serving the interests of peace and security in South Asia. But that's a uh, that's something for which, at least in Pakistan, there is a deep desire. Our government has been to the Indian Ocean and then to Red Sea and and Mediterranean. So, and 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 the the part of that connects Pakistan with China, called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPAC as it is called, was really not part of OBOR, but now connects the OBOR. So in a way, it has become a centerpiece of uh, OBOR. Uh, we think that it will usher enormous opportunities uh, uh, for both countries, but also for the whole region. I think the whole region can benefit, because the only reason why we are doing what we are doing in case of uh, CPAC is because that will create more opportunities, particularly for Pakistan, where we need that these youth need to get engaged. We are a young country, and this youth bulge need, must get involved. Otherwise, there is a fear that they could become cannon fodder for the militants. So therefore, it is important, and this we, we see it in the in the larger perspective, and we find that there is a there is a great deal of uh, uh, utility and benefit for us, for Western China, but also for the uh, for the whole region. Uh, I think the, that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sums up my initial uh, points. Uh, I would deliberately like to pause. I did not touch a number of issues that I know that would be raised. Uh, so why don't I, I uh, leave it to the questions and answers where I think it might be more interesting. Is that fine? That's fine. Thank you very All much. Right. Uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, so I, uh, and maybe you can your um, 
microphone now. I appreciated uh, that upbeat uh, presentation, the, uh, noting the uh, decline in terrorism, the uptick in economic activity and optimism, uh, the potential for improved relations with neighbors, the uh, economic uh, uh, corridor with China. There's a lot to, uh, to talk about, and I'm glad that you focused on the positive. As you, as you mentioned, um, there are a lot of other uh, issues that are out there, and I'm sure we'll get to them in the next uh, 40 minutes. I'm going to pose some questions myself, which yeah. aren't meant to be mean, but because they're in the press, uh, <laughs> we, need to, we need to talk about yeah. uh, them. And uh, I invite questions from the audience in the usual fashion, catch my eye, uh, we'll bring a microphone to you, state your name and affiliation, and uh, don't give a speech. Uh, so um, I think the, you know, the most recent uh, uh, news uh, regarding the bilateral relationship was uh, Secretary Mattis' uh, decision to withhold the $50 million, the uh, latest tranche of the, um, of the military aid uh, under um, the guys because uh, Pakistan was deemed not to have taken sufficient action mm -hmm. against the Haqqani network. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, my, in the last 10 years, I keep hearing about the Haqqani network, and mm -hmm. it's always been this uh, issue between Pakistan and the United States. Why can't you just do something about this Haqqani network and, uh, and keep it from, uh, from creating trouble and killing Americans and destabilizing Afghanistan? Certainly, I think uh, uh, we know uh, that the original motivation that stems from that nationwide consensus includes all terrorists, and that includes the Taliban and the Haqqanis. And we are taking action. They were holed up in uh, North Waziristan, and we have flushed them out of that or eliminated whoever was, uh, uh, came within the range. And uh, so we are very clear. They are not our proxies. They are not our bet. Uh, but at the same time, we know that bulk of Haqqanis are in Afghanistan. And they are operating from there. Uh, and we believe that there are uh, forces in Afghanistan which all should also tackle them and, and control them. We believe that that uh, this whole tendency sometimes knee-jerk reaction to place the blame of for every security lapse in Afghanistan on Pakistan's doorsteps is also not not healthy. Uh, uh, for example, 31 May terrorist incident in Kabul. 15 minutes after that, it was blamed on Pakistan. Now, if the intelligence in Afghanistan was that good, they should have prevented it from happening. Good point. Uh, but uh, I think this has not helped. In fact, uh, the solution that is being found uh, is uh, to scapegoat Pakistan to justify failures in Afghanistan. And we don't think that uh, that is a good idea. Even if you keep doing that, that will not help Afghanistan in any manner. Uh, we are all in it together. We, these are our common enemies, and we have to fight them. I think no nation has done more in that direction than Pakistan. We have suffered the most. We are still suffering, but we are also winning. And we have shown that the tide of terrorism can be reversed. We have achieved results which are for all to see. There used to be 150 terrorist incidents per month up till 2014. Today, they are far and few between. So we have done it, and we have shown that they, they can, be, can be made to run for their life. Uh, as far as the United States' decision to curtail uh, CSF, uh, we believe that all that Pakistan has done in the fight against terrorism has not been sufficiently factored into, into that. Uh, we may I also remind that this is not an aid or assistance, it is a reimbursement of the services uh, that Pakistan had rendered in facilitating uh, United States troops, uh, either by means of ground lines of communications or uh, air lines of communications. Nevertheless, it's a decision that the U.S. has made and uh, we respect that. But uh, uh, I think we will continue the fight that we are doing. 
uh, because it is in our own interest and it is in the interest of, uh, of our region. Well, thanks very much. So that was a very clear. I have a couple of follow-on questions, if I may. And again, I invite uh, from the audience. I don't want to um, monopolize this. Um, there may be uh, some differences of definition of what is a terrorist. The uh, United States uh, recently designated uh, Sayed uh, Salahuddin, who is based in Pakistan. He's, uh, he's from uh, Kashmir. I designated him a global terrorist. Uh, your government uh, uh, was not so happy about that, uh, said it was unjustified. Why are these differences in, in, in how we designate uh, terrorists? If somebody is conducting activity that uh, is uh, attacking civilians, isn't that the prima facie a case uh, of a designation? What is unfolding and happening in the Indian occupied Kashmir uh, is so uh, tragic. People are being killed at whim. Hundreds of videos have shown up how those Kashmiris, innocent, armless Kashmiri, unarmed Kashmiris are being uh, killed by police high-handedness. And the people of Pakistan are uh, deeply concerned at, uh, at, uh, at that situation. The people of Pakistan and people of Kashmir have lived for centuries together. They, have, they are related, they have cultural bonds, and they feel for each other. And therefore, it is only natural that the people of Pakistan would feel uh, pained when they see uh, the, the you know, intransigent forces unleashing terror on the ordinary people of Kashmir. And there are voices that uh, speak about these human rights violations. Uh, I think uh, to express those voices is, uh, is uh, not, not just. Uh, I believe the international community should also take notice uh, of these uh, uh, gross human rights violations. Uh, should not, there should not be a selectivity of uh, human rights uh, being violated in certain segment of people, uh, while in others they are, uh, you know, highlighted. So therefore, that is that is the view that the government of Pakistan holds, that we stand with the people of Kashmir, uh, and we will continue to extend our political, moral, and diplomatic support to the people of Kashmir. Thank you very much. That that was clear too. Uh, let me just follow, one ask, uh, follow up, and then I'll go to the, go to you uh, in the audience. The, um, you you made the point that the military assistance from the United States, the funding, is not aid; it's uh, it's payment for services. It's uh, transactional. If the uh, ongoing U.S. Uh, Afghan review of Afghan policy uh, results in a decision to uh, send more U.S. forces to Afghanistan, they're going to need a supply route. Uh, they're going to need services, air and land uh, uh, routes. Uh, is Pakistan um, going to be negotiating uh, uh, this issue um, before allowing such supply to uh, insist on the payment uh, up front for the services? Well, these and all other issues are always negotiated because uh, that's in the nature of the business. Otherwise, you wouldn't know uh, what to do. Uh, Pakistan has facilitated G-locks and A-locks like no one. Since 2001, all air corridors from Pakistan have been available free of cost to the United States. I am not an authority on one belt, one road. It's a Chinese project, and they, would, they can explain that better. But I can explain the rationale and the basis for which, by which uh, CPAC was envisaged. Uh, it was 2013 uh, when the present leadership in China, which came to power at that time, President Xi, uh, they came up with the plan to develop Western China. Bulk of their investments and uh, development was in Eastern China. And, uh, and, and for that, Western China is 5,000 kilometers from Eastern China. And then add to that the 8,000 kilometers before they reach the mouth of Red Sea. And if you come down from Kashgar to Gavadar, it's only 2,000 kilometers. So 13,000 versus 2,000. So it made perfect sense for them to, to envisage this. Right about the same time when the present government took over, they had an economic priority. 
uh, uh, to find, uh, to maximize economic opportunities. So they saw in it an opportunity for Pakistan also because uh, the western part of Pakistan is less developed and less populated than the eastern part and central part. And therefore it was an opportunity that came our way that if this route can pass through the western China, uh, uh, from western China to Gawadar via western route through Balochistan, Particularly, I think it will open up many opportunities, and that is exactly what is happening. Uh, since the good news doesn't travel that much or is not propagated, but I want to tell you I've seen and sat through briefings uh, uh, about the infrastructure development that is taking place in Balochistan. It is enormous, and uh, and I think it has opened up so many uh, opportunities for the Baloch people to benefit from uh, from this project. So we we see that CPEC is going to be. Uh, a hugely beneficial project for both Western China and for, for Western Pakistan. But also, uh, I think the region, I have, we have always been, uh, we've seen that if you go up north from Gawadar, the first uh, beneficiary could be uh, uh, the province of Kandahar in Afghanistan. So we have been talking to the Chinese on westward extension of CPAC, for example. Uh, and uh, we see there is a lot of benefit that, that will accrue to, to us and to the whole world. In fact, there are many other countries of the region which are very excited. On 1st of March this year, five heads of states and f uh, five, um, three prime ministers and five heads of uh, uh, state like presidents came together in Islamabad and they stood and they were all very excited because the entire Central Asia can find a route through this. To, uh, to the sea. So uh, we can see that there, is the, uh, there, there are opportunities not only for Pakistan but also for the whole region. We've also seen that uh, uh, Iranians want to use this from Chabahar to Gwadar and, 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 and reach out to China. We've seen Oman and other countries also uh, wanting to use this route because it's clearly a shorter route to uh, manage their trade with China. So. All in all, uh, we, we see that there is a great economic rationale for, for, for this project. Thank you. And thank you, Matt, for asking that question that was on my list. Uh, and the third row here, um, on the inside, yes, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jim Baker, a consultant for the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. And I wanted to ask about uh, Pakistan's role in uh, climate change and renewable energy as you go about your rapid development. Well, uh, well, we are one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, and uh, and therefore, uh, you know, I uh, I have given this example. I think I would repeat it here. In 2010, when we had these flash floods, part of the glacier Himalaya in the Himalayas melted. We didn't know, but when the bulge of this water started flowing across Indus River, now Indus River goes from north of the country right to the south of the country. So uh, wherever it went, it spread its uh, destruction two kilometers on either side and kept moving. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, horror we can see if global warming goes on and if these glaciers begin to or, you know, continue to melt. So therefore, for us, it's a very serious issue. For us, it's a, it's a matter of survival of the country and of our ecological system. Uh, water is life for us because our land is irrigated by five rivers. All of them merge into Indus River. So therefore, for us, it's a very, very important issue. And we were happy that the global efforts had culminated into Paris Agreement, which we participated and attended. And uh, our efforts, in whatever way, uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change will continue. Thank you very much. I since you mentioned Laura, and uh, she caught my eye, I'll ask Laura, then I'll go to you uh, in the third row after her. We'll, we'll come to you next, sir. Again, yeah, get, the microphone is coming. It's coming, right? Good morning. Great to see you here in Washington. Laura Holgate, former U.S. Ambassador to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, I wanted to just give you a chance to share with this group some of the conversations you and I have had over the years about nuclear terrorism, the connection with your terrorism comments today, and also expand it to think about bioterrorism. And these are issues that, that are very much of concern in the region uh, in which Pakistan finds itself, and I'd be very interested to hear your take on Pakistan's view on the threat and the steps taking to manage that. 
Mm, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Laura. It was uh, my personal uh, privilege to work with you throughout the Nuclear Security Summit process. You are an accomplished uh, diplomat and we saw you in action. Uh, I think that process uh, served the humanity very well. Uh, we participated actively in that and many of the uh, achievements can be attributed to that process that we made in the strategic domain. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, Pakistan uh, wants to be a responsible nuclear state uh, and that uh, responsibility entails that we participate with the international community uh, in ensuring um, that uh, our nuclear program is safe, uh, is secure, uh, um, with no chances of proliferation of any dual use technology uh, and, and with no possibility of any terrorist uh, having ever any access to our nuclear assets or for that matter to the nuclear assets all over the world. So, so that's the kind of uh, commitment that we have. The only rationale for our nuclear program is to deter aggression. Uh, uh, and that uh, we think is working and is, 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 is good, but we are guided by credible minimum deterrence uh, with focus both on credible and, and minimum. Uh, because we want to uh, keep our, our deterrence uh, robust. But we have a huge uh, civilian program, uh, civilian nuclear energy program, uh, over 40 years of uh, power generation using nuclear energy and, and uh, touch wood, it has been uh, accident free completely. Uh, our nuclear assets are, are completely secure. Uh, uh, together with your country, we have made many, many uh, mm, you know, efforts, uh, including setting up of a mm, center of excellence in Islamabad. Uh, I think, uh, I don't remember whether you accompanied Rose Gottmuller when you visited that or not, but that, that is there, which is becoming a regional hub for, uh, for uh, promoting nuclear security. Uh, so we are quite, quite conscious of that, uh, uh, that uh, threat of nuclear terrorism, and therefore we take extra precautions to make sure that uh, no terrorist ever comes, uh, comes uh, close to that. We are very actively participating in the 1540 process. We have submitted our reports in a timely manner uh, because we believe that it is, this is uh, how it should be. Uh, you are with IEA, you know that on their website, uh, there are more than, I don't know what the last count I read was 2,765 or something. Uh, uh, thefts of uh, fissile material, not from one from Pakistan, and we are quite uh, 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 you know particular uh, about that. And together with the, uh, with the, with your counterpart Rose Gottmala, we worked a lot in that working group uh, called SNAP Security, Strategic Stability, and Non-Proliferation, and we achieved a number of benchmarks. Uh, mm, you know, our export controls, for example, uh, mm, we are proud to say that we uh, are all our export control lists are compliant with the major export control regimes. Uh, mm, we have now declared unilaterally uh, adherence to NSG uh, guidelines. What is the relationship with Libya as it is now with its government or governments and what is the opinion of the Pakistani government on the ceasefire that was brokered between Prime Minister El Siraj and Marshal Hafter by French President Macron just yesterday? I didn't prep you on this question. Uh, <laughs> I won't be surprised if you don't have well, a detailed uh, answer. Uh, well, when the nations in Africa were going through a phase of decolonization, and their freedom struggles, of course, Pakistan stood with all of them. And we supported them and we were happy that it happened. And I think the, the country we are sitting in also was equally supportive of those uh, legitimate causes of uh, self-determination and independence. And therefore, we, we did support that. Beyond that, in the recent years, we have seen that Libya has gone through a lot. I mean, a lot of turmoil has happened and we are sad about that because the people of Libya have suffered. Uh, mm, uh, we uh, have an embassy in Tripoli, uh, but uh, because of uh, the uh, political instability uh, in that country, which we hope will uh, finish soon, 
and there will be greater stability. Any effort that is made uh, in Libya to, to bring stability, we of course support that. But we do not have any particular active engagement in Libya uh, in any political uh, context. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in the sec sec third, second row from the back, the young lady, and then after that, the uh, gentleman. Uh, yeah. Nick. Your Excellency, please, thank you so much for speaking with us today. My name is Kelly McDonald, and I'm with APCO Worldwide. We're a global communications firm based here in DC. I was wondering, you mentioned both the strong relationship Pakistan has with China and that you wish you had more fruitful of a dialogue with India. As the border crisis in Sikkim between the two nations continues to escalate, well, how do you think that will impact your relationship with both countries? Well, uh, mm. We do not regard any two relationships as zero-sum. And I have said that publicly also in case of our relations with China, that it is not a zero-sum for our relations with the United States. The United States is a very, very important. If, if we have strong relations with China, but we want equally strong relations with the United States because we go back in time. For 70 years, we worked together, and 50s and 60s and 80s and 2000s are a witness and attestation of that. So therefore, we are equally keen that this relationship uh, mm, between us and China and between us and the United States remains strong. Uh, as for relations with uh, India, uh, mm, it's a pity that we could not succeed in, uh, uh, in forming a joint uh, front against the forces of terrorism. Uh, mm, every time Pakistan and India have tried to come closer, we have seen that these terrorists come into action. And uh, because India's suspends the dialogue, they sit back and relax because their purpose has been served. So we have said this to Indians that, look, why don't we keep talking and, and, and uh, coordinating in order to isolate these elements. But uh, so far, uh, Indians are not convinced of that argument, and therefore it is, it is, it is not happening. But relations of India with China, uh, of course, uh, China and India both are uh, entitled to maintain their own relationships in whatever manner they have. I know they, had, they have extensive trade and economic relations, but they also have issues on the border. Uh, so like any two nations, I think these, uh, these issues are to be resolved by themselves. Thank you. We'll start going, uh, taking two questions at a time. I'm going to take the two gentlemen on the side back there, and then we'll come toward the front. There's, there's two, so one and then, and then after him in back. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed Omar from NDU Islamabad. Uh, my question, Mr. Ambassador, is you mentioned that Afghanistan has been used as a safe haven for terrorists in the past that have conducted operations in Pakistan. With Pakistan, the military engaged in uh, Hybrid 4 currently, uh, targeting the group you mentioned earlier, uh, Jamaatul uh, Ahrar and Daesh followers. What is Pakistan expecting from Afghanistan to ensure that the groups that the military defeats in, on its border does not regroup in Afghanistan. I think, if, yeah, would, you mind, you, would you mind taking no. another one? Just yeah, sure. Get more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir I'm the Washington correspondent for Airway News TV, Pakistan. Uh, sir, I have this uh, kind of same question. Uh, sir, uh, your statement, uh, Mr. You. Ambassador, on record in Washington, you always uh, 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 said that uh, peace uh, can bring in Afghanistan only is that if you get Taliban on the tables. And yesterday, the State Department spokesperson also said, also offered Taliban uh, for the talks uh, to come on the table. So what is the Pakistani, Pakistan role uh, to bring peace in Afghanistan? And secondly, uh, as you know, that uh, half of the world is uh, now uh, uh, fighting against Daesh uh, to defeat the Daesh. So what is the Pakistan policy uh, in Syria regarding President Assad? Thank you. So actually, we got three questions there, two, yeah. on, two on Pakistan, one on Syria. All right. Uh, uh, mm. The sanctuaries and safe havens that have been created in Kunar and, and Noristan and Nangarha, I think, are a matter of great concern for us. And we have been cautioning all the time. You know, why this occurred in the first place was because when we were taking action in North Waziristan, we were constantly expecting and, and, and uh, alerting the Afghan forces and also the US forces to create an anvil there because these people will come and you need to. But that was, didn't happen. So, so now they have their safe sanctuaries inside uh, these three provinces in Afghanistan. And all our attacks since December 2014, when they first came and attacked our uh, school children and they uh, killed mercilessly 137 children, 
uh, ever since all our attacks are attributed to those sanctuaries that are inside Afghanistan. So these are constantly, even the Lahore attack that you talked about last Monday, uh, we have now found out that it was conducted by Jamaatul Ahrar and the persons came from the same very sanctuaries. Uh, and we are obviously very concerned about it because uh, there's a lot of propaganda that goes on that Pakistan has safe havens and Pakistan has sanctuaries, whereas nobody can actually find them uh, ever. Uh, but they keep talking about them and nobody talks about those sanctuaries from which actually terrorism is flowing out. And so uh, we hope that uh, the Afghan government, instead of uh, blaming Pakistan all the time, should pay attention to that because uh, today they are attacking Pakistan, tomorrow they'll be attacking Afghanistan. For the second question that you had on uh, mm, Taliban coming to peace talks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm, two attempts were made uh, mm, in the past uh, two and a half years. Uh, unfortunately, both did not succeed. Uh, in the first talk round, which was 7th July 2015, I think it was a very important step forward when both sides sat face to face. Uh, first time the Taliban fa sat face to face with a government that they never recognized. Uh, so we had great hopes and before they were to meet on 31st July, uh, uh, unfortunately the, uh, the news was spread uh, in a manner that created uh, panic and therefore uh, talks were suspended. And then we waited and created a new momentum in the form of quadrilateral coordination group where Pakistan, Afghanistan, China and United States came together in December 2015. We worked, produced a road, road map for five months, and then 21 May 2016, Mullah Akhtar Mansoor, with whom we were all talking, uh, was uh, uh, killed by a drone strike. And ever since, there was a stalemate. And because there was a stalemate, and, uh, and there was a desire from uh, US uh, side, and also from the Afghan side, that Pakistan should uh, squeeze space on them, should take them on kinetically, should uh, not allow them to live in parks. And that's what we started doing. And once we started doing that, they started running away. And as a result, bulk of them are now uh, not on Pakistan. They are uh, inside Afghanistan. And we have, to that extent, we have uh, our ability to influence them to come to talks has been eroded. Uh, um, then there are other players which have come in, in Afghanistan. And uh, the rather ambiguous messaging from uh, Afghan government has also not helped matters. Uh, so a number of things must come together in order for the, these uh, political reconciliation process to succeed. Uh, it cannot occur in a vacuum. You know, if you, are, uh, if you see the Taliban and if you see the ground situation according to well, it is now dated because of Afghan president made this statement about six months back that 60% of the territory is under Afghan forces control and 30% with others and 10% with Taliban. We understand from US sources that it has slipped down to 52%. So with so many militant groups roaming around in those ungoverned spaces, uh, uh, achieving peace and reconciliation becomes that much more difficult. Therefore, it is extremely important that uh, instead of just looking for a military solution in Afghanistan, a comprehensive political strategy is adopted. And I think that voices we hear now increasingly more and more in, in the US too. Uh, we do hope that uh, when that happens, uh, reconciliation will be part of that. Uh, and uh, mm, uh, we know that all Af countries uh, mm, will have to play a part in, 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 in making that happen. Taliban is an Afghanistan specific phenomena. They are not a global presence. And therefore, there is an every reason uh, in our view that all Afghan factions need to sit together and find some kind of political solution. And all other countries, including Pakistan, including the United States, including China, should facilitate. And we are ready to do that part because we believe that a politically stable Afghanistan will be not only good for Afghanistan but also for good good for us. And the third question was um, on Syria. Um. On Syria, uh, in Syria we have all along maintained uh, uh, that we would like to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Syria. 
We have also followed the principle of non-interference and non-intervention, whether it is Syria or any other country in the Middle East. And we have strictly, strictly followed. These are UN Charter principles, and we have respected them. Uh, we also are uh, uh, in favor of efforts for finding a peaceful solution. Issues of Baluchistan-based uh, uh, terrorist groups in, in Iran. Can you say anything about uh, those kind of relations? Well, we, uh, the day before yesterday, we had a major meeting of Border Commission in Tehran. Uh, every time uh, some incident takes place of any kind, uh, we always make sure that uh, the institutions which have been created for this purpose come into play. Uh, with Iran, we generally have a very cordial relationship. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a strong economic relationship with Iran because of the sanctions that had been imposed on Iran, although it is a neighbor. We were energy starved, uh, but we could not get cheaper energy from next door. Uh, we could not have bilateral trade with them the way we needed mm -hmm. to have. Uh, so uh, we, we have suffered from actually these sanctions indirectly, these sanctions on, uh, on Iran. But on the whole, uh, this is a, these are very difficult uh, borders, uh, rugged, uh, not easy to manage. So many uh, uh, you know, forces come into play which try to, you know, these militants sneak back and forth. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes they create uh, um, unsavvy situations too. But on the whole, we have our institutions in place to, uh, to tackle those issues. Thanks very much. I'll give the last question to my former boss, uh, Robin Rafel. Uh, Mike, Mike, come in. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I wanted to return just for a moment to the ongoing policy debate on Afghanistan policy here in Washington and ask you, you've, you've hinted at uh, some of the elements, but to ask you if you were able to write that uh, policy from Pakistan's uh, perspective, what would be the key elements? What would you like to see coming out of that policy review? What would you like to see that's different, that's a continuation of the, of the same elements? Um, I think that would be useful perspective thank you, for us. Thank, thank you. you. I think the uh, first uh, suggestion that we would make is to convince ourselves that there is no military solution to Afghanistan. There has to be a political solution. You know, uh, we can't uh, 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 keep on doing the same. You know, if the military solution was to come forth with 144,000 troops, it would have come, come by. I think there has to be a political solution. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have any favorites, not at all. We only want that all these factions in Afghanistan should come together and, and talk it out. And for that, uh, a number of things must happen. One, that Afghan government must give unambiguous message that they are serious in, in talks, that the Taliban and other groups who want to join these talks will have more to gain on the table than they would have on the battlefield. Uh, that Pakistan, China, and United States should facilitate. They have an office in, Taliban have an office in Doha, but all these countries have their own contacts with them. Uh, so we, uh, I think that, that is another important requirement that we should convince ourselves that we have to facilitate in, in all earnest. Uh, and the same message must go from, to Taliban from all of us that there is no other option but to sit on the table. That they also uh, must not uh, remain convinced that they can gain uh, full control of the, uh, uh, of the country uh, militarily. We are quite convinced. From our side, message to Taliban has been very stark and very clear. We don't want to see them come to power in of Kabul by force. Because we know that they may have their own likes on, on our side and we will have a trouble. And therefore, we are very clear, as open as I am as I'm saying. Therefore, but we all have to uh, give the same message to the Taliban, that there is a, there is a process, a political process in Afghanistan. You should, you should join that. The third element that I would say is uh, border management. We think that border management is extremely important. This has been an open border. And uh, uh, militants uh, have been crossing it at will. 
So mm, we have started unilaterally because Afghanistan was not forthcoming. The bilateral uh, border SOPs that were formed and which were in, in play, uh, trilateral SOPs as, as we call them at that time between United States, Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, ran out on 31st of uh, December of 2014 uh, when the United States decided to downsize. Uh, ever since, those SOPs are not in place. The draft is lying with the Afghanistan government and they are not. They keep raising the issue of Durand line. Now, is this really the right time to raise that issue of Durand line? The right time, the, the, the real issue at this time is to interdict the cross-border movement of terrorists. So that's what we are focusing on. Uh, whether Afghan government cooperates or not, we have started managing that border unilaterally. It doesn't mean that we will stop the flow of uh, legitimate bona fide travelers, not at all. But just to put in the uh, immigration counters and, and you know, uh, fences wherever required, uh, so that we don't allow uh, cross-border movement with these terrorists. And it will also help us, mind you, no country has suffered more from the trouble in Afghanistan because not only came the, uh, uh, you know, refugees and others, but the criminal mafia and, and clashing of culture and uh, all that also came with it uh, to us. So we, we think that this border needs to be managed better and we, in some aspects, we are receiving cooperation from the US but we think we need to do better. The fourth element would be to do something about refugees. I think Afghan refugees, particularly Afghan refugee camps, uh, 1.7 million live in refugee camps. So, uh, you know, they have become a, a security issue now because the recruitment takes place there and these, in any case, 37 years, uh, other countries can't handle a million refugees and we are handling 37, uh, 3 million refugees for 37 years. I think they need to go back and the uh, situation should be created, uh, in sent pull up, uh, you know, pull factors should be created. So that should also be a, a part of this. And final fifth element that I would say is a better relationship between Pakistan government and Afghan government. I think until or unless that happens, things will not move. Our reproaches to Afghan government, unfortunately, have not met with much success. Uh, we think that we need intel to intel, mill to mill, uh, political to political, diplomatic to diplomatic, all levels engagement. I think engagement is the answer. So we have conveyed that message many times to the Afghan government, but they somehow uh, uh, think that uh, they are not convinced. So m these are the five elements I would stipulate that, in our view, would be useful. Mr. Ambassador, I have the impression that you could go on more in this vein, uh, but we run out of time. Uh, I thank you very much for enlivening our um, ambassador's forum. Uh, series with your uh, insightful, frank, uh, uh, concise, clear, and animated uh, responses to all of the questions that have been posed. Um, we didn't get too many questions uh, via Twitter. We had one comment that said, why is the ambassador to the United States speaking to a British think tank? Well, <laughs> this is IISS Americas, uh, and we're an international think tank. But we've had very good relations uh, with your government. I go to Pakistan every year. I've welcomed the times I've been able to meet you there. And I thank you very much for coming here. Please join me in thanking uh, the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you.